Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson from SaveWithConrad.com. Heads up, homeowners, all of a sudden your house is worth more than ever these last few years. But what are we going to do with that newfound equity? No, I'm not suggesting you sell your house or go buy something else. But didn't we all make this decision when we bought a house where we said, hey, someday we'd like to, and one day it would be nice if, maybe it's the dream kitchen, maybe it's an in-ground pool, maybe it's a man cave. But you've got this newfound equity, and I think we should use some of that equity to turn your house into your dream home with no money out of pocket. But even better than that, we're routinely helping folks do this, and they wind up with a cheaper monthly payment. So if you got the dream house you always wanted with no money out of pocket, and your payments went down, how easy is that? Find out how easy it is to turn your house into your dream home with no money out of pocket right now at SaveWithConrad.com. We can't wait to hear about your projects. Tell us what your dream is. We're going to help you make it happen at SaveWithConrad.com. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lenders. Woo! Welcome to Something to Wrestle With. Birds. Richard. Who's Richard? Well, you know. That's not a rib. She pooed it. She pooed it. What a rib. No, you have a There's no box of gimmicks. Rumor and innuendo. I don't deal in rumor and innuendo. It, it, it. Was he there? I was there. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I ain't scared. I ain't scared of shit. Fuck him. You, Bruce. I love Pritchard. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? I'm staring off into the distance here because I've got a picture that is staring right back at me, and I'm trying to figure out who in the hell other than me is in that damn picture. But anyway, that's for another day and another time. I am doing absolutely fantastic. I'm doing fantastic too, man. We have had a, a really fun couple of weeks as wrestling fans. Of course, we had a big pay-per-view this past weekend. Our great close personal friend, Cody Rhodes is now one half of the undisputed tag team champions. I thought Shinsuke Nakamura and Seth Rollins tore the house down. Just an incredible Say show. Again. Shinsuke Nakamura. Okay. Was that close? Oh, Yeah. Remember, I used to, you would tell me I'd go. I said, ah, I don't know who the hell you're talking about. They got this Shinsuke guy on here, and like, I don't think you're, I don't you're think like you're talking sure. all funny and stuff, like Shinsuke. And then I met Shin, and I'm like, oh, okay, I get it now. Oh, I got it now. But I thought I, I, I'm looking at it phonetically. It's Shinsuke. Well, yeah. Shinsuke. It's there's just another, There's it's another. Just another there's another wrestler that my bartender once referred to like it was a Project Pat song and said, is his name Take Shita? Yeah. Like, no, it's Takeshita. He goes, no, I don't think no, it is. I don't think it is. Well, it is. Trust no, me. No. Uh, hey, man, John Cena's back tagging with uh, LA Knight. And uh, yeah, people seem pretty happy about that. It was a fun show. It was a great Monday Night Raw. I really enjoyed it. And man, I got to tell you, I sat down and watched NXT front to back for the first time in a long time. It was awesome, dude. Like you, I know you don't do anything on that necessarily, or maybe you do. I don't know. Everything great in the WWE is because of Bruce, I do. and everything this you is hate is WWE. somebody else. Everything you hate in WWE is Ed Koski. Let's get that on the record right now. Nobody ever gives him any credit whatsoever. You know, there's more folks up there than just Hunter and. Uh, and Bruce, right? Y'all like there's a whole squad of people working to entertain you, but man, NXT Let's was talented cool. people in the entertainment business without question. That crowd was the real star of NXT this week, man. I mean, I just love that vibe and that environment. I found myself saying, I'm going to watch this next week, which I'm sure my wife will be thrilled with yet another day that I watch wrestling on TV. There you go. Yeah. Well, listen, we, uh, maybe at times we've all had a little, <clears throat> too much wrestling. And that's what we're here to talk about today because we're back talking about more of that now damn infamous box of gimmicks. But before we get there, I want to remind you that this box of gimmicks is a uh, really an OG thing from something to wrestle. I mean, we've been talking about that since the very beginning of our show way back in 2016, around that same time, we also started to 
wonder about the great mysteries of professional wrestling. You know the one. How big's Batista's dick? Well, we found out the answer two weeks ago. Be sure to check out our Batista episode. The answer lies within. And there's way more meat on the bone. <laughs> <laughs> you said we'll talk me. About Batista in the future. Uh, and we'll get there. But today, let's have some fun, man. Uh, by the way, if you missed uh, our previous discussion on the box of gimmicks, check the archives at something to wrestle.com. We covered a ton of crazy ones. Speaking of crazy ones, let's get into one right now. How about Kizarni? Uh, this is a, a friend of ours here on the program, but Kizarni, I guess that's a play on wrestling's travel carnival origins and the performers back then, I guess, were carnies. But now we're we're speaking carny even in the name. So it's K-I-Z-A-R-N-Y. And uh, yeah. He debuted in October of 2008, as you and I are recording this, 15 years ago. There was a vignette with carnival music and footage of a Ferris wheel. And here he comes, a wide-eyed man with blonde hair, a nose ring, black eye makeup, some specially carved out facial hair. My name is Kazarni. We is welcome to Izo, the AZ. See, as of our, I don't even know how I'm doing this, but yeah, talk to me about Kizarni. How in the world does this come to be? Of course, we know in real life, he's pals with Edge and Christian, trained by Ron Hutchinson, and then uh, later worked a lot with Jake Roberts and more specifically, perhaps your brother, Dr. Tom. These days, we see him as Sin Bodhi. Talk to me about Kizarni. How does this come to be? Well, he, he was a carny uh, growing up. Uh, if I remember correctly, his parents were, were carnies. And, you know, when people talk about carny, a lot of times they don't really understand what the hell they're talking about or what it actually is and the, and the roots of it. Back in the day, you know, and there, there still are, there's a segment that still does it to this day, not to the extent that it was done in the early days, but the carnival would travel across the country and yes. the carnival would bring with it rides and attractions and freak shows and oddities of the world, if you will, uh, to come into your town. They would stay depending upon the size of the, the market. They would stay for so many days and people would come from all over to, to ride the rides, to test their skill at the games of skill to win a big prize or to, to see the bearded lady, or to see the giant man, or to see the Siamese twins, whatever it may be. And the Carnies had a bad reputation for coming in, rigging the games, uh, ripping people off, taking as much money as they could out of a town. And in the olden days, like during the Depression, when they would go in, got a bad reputation because people would take their hard-earned money and go and get kind of conned out of their money because of the rigged games and the way that things were, were laid out. And the carnies, they became known as carnies because they worked in the carnival and traveled from town to town. So if you're part of the carnival, you were a carny. Whether you were a performer or whether you just worked and were one of the people doing the games or a ride operator, whatever that may be were then a carny um the term mark even you know that we we use for uh people i hate that term in the, in the wrestling business because really the only marks are the ones in the dressing rooms most of the time and a mark was actually a mark if you find someone that is pretty gullible or whatever the, the the carny like the the boss would go and take a piece of chalk big wide piece of chalk and they would hey buddy how you doing and as they're patting you on the back they would mark you with a big line on your back hence the mark so when the operators would come through you would either have a mark that would win the games where you would rig them so they would win Hey, buddy, oh, my God, you're red hot. Come on, man, keep, you know, keep pumping in that money. They let them win one, and then they make them lose 10. 
So that's where the term mark came from. It was actually a mark put on people by the guy that usually ran the carnival. Go, hey, here's the Ms. Ark. Out of place, set your case. Set your pay. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Out of place, you want to throw the ball? All you got to do, watch how easy it is. Boom, big, dang, go. Do it, try one. It's on me. Boom, oh my God, you win since it was on me. Here's a prize. All right, buddy. Hey, you want to get that big one right there? All you got to do is do that three more times. That's right. Big, hey, you got it. Oh, you missed. Hey, but you can do it again, you know, and just do the do the whole thing, man. So that was the carnival. Now, you know, when people talk about the, the, the language of the carnival, it's, it's, it's called carny. You know, it has its own language. Um, I'm not going to explain it here, but if you want to learn, if you if you really want to understand, there's a movie. It stars Gary Busey and Jodie Foster. Uh, it's called Carney. When I was, uh, God, man, Tom was in California, I believe, but but uh, called me and was would basically test me on what I learned, you know, on the business and different things, and and, and he would speak to me sometimes in Carney. I had no idea what he was talking about. So he told me to go and get this movie, Carney. So if you want to learn about the carnival, you want to learn about the inner workings of the carnival, that's the place to go, man. Go and, and watch that movie. Great movie. Um, and uh, you, maybe you learn a few things. Or maybe you can understand a little bit about the Carney life and the Carney lifestyle and those that live that life. It's kind of like the circus in that it, it is your life. Everybody on the road with you is your family. And it's very family oriented and very um, just a close knit group of people and very cool. So Nick Kizardi, uh came from a Carney background and we thought, well, hell, that's, that's kind of cool. And it was different. Um, tremendous performer. And Thought, well, you know, let's make him a carny. And then came up with the name Kiz Arney and just had him speak in carny uh, for his promos and everything. People didn't know what the hell he was talking about. But, um, you know, it, it, as you know, sometimes things just don't work out. And he was, we were looking for a lot of, a lot of things from him, but it just, you know, um, I guess it just didn't work out. And uh, it's a shame because I do think that it was a unique deal that if we could have gotten into, there's um, the Jim Rose oddities that may still actually tour. I don't know. Uh, you used to call it the freak show. You can't call it a freak show anymore. But that was one of the sideshows. And uh, Nick has already was a uh, part of, part of that and that's kind of what we based it on was the oddities and the 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 freak show um that was a part of the carnival for so many years the sword swallower the the half man half lady and things of that nature so it was based in reality man it was based based in that world and i'm not sure that this world was really ready for that gimmick uh, at the time when it actually debuted. So kind of a bummer because I liked it. You're not Conrad. <laughs> so all hey, that was wait a minute. What you oh my god! <laughs> Conrad's dead. What ha what happened? Are you wearing his clothes? No, no, no. Me, Connie? Uh, uh, it's it's me. It's me. It's it's Dave. You changed your name? It's just <laughs> Thompson. And hey, hey, it's Conrad. Oh, no, no, I didn't change that. No, no. Oh, there he oh, is. God, oh, my God, Conrad, you died. Oh, oh, thank you, baby Jesus, because I was I was terrified. I was talking to you, and then all of a sudden, it came up, and it says, hey, hey, it's Conrad down on the thing. And I was like, it wasn't you, but you had changed because – it was him, and then he talked, and oh my God, I was I was coming to just console Megan because you had died, and but now you're back. He's oh, alive. God. It's a miracle. It's a, it's a miracle. miracle. I did it. I laid hands upon it, and you returned and revived to life. 
Oh, God, it's a mess. Speak to me. Can you speak? Can you speak, son? Rumors of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. Oh! I am indeed here. Oh! oh, thank you, baby Jesus. Thank you for, for bringing him back to where he belongs. I was just going along. I mean, I was I was on a roll. And then, boom, you weren't there anymore, and there was some dude in a hat. It's less than ideal. I'll tell you that. It's less than ideal. Scary. Yeah. Are you, you know, okay? Were, Are you okay? You know, there were rumors on YouTube this week that I died. Turns out it was just my Firefox that died. But Okay. Uh, All right. But you're okay now? Oh, I'm good to go. <sighs> hey, we're folks. Up. Hey, folks. Conrad's not dead. I'm not dead. Well, scared Rumor me. and innuendo, not dead. Uh, let's talk oh, about. Oh, wow. I had to take a big swig that time. Are, are, are we rocking prom this morning? I hope so. Oh, yeah. There we go. Hey, so uh, the juice. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I feel like we should mention. Uh, it's this a week- miracle. This weekend, your great close personal friend, uh, Logan Paul, as far as as of right now, is going to be fighting Dylan Dennis. Of course, uh, we'll see actually what happens there. But I can't I can't throw a jab with the left man. Sorry, the shoulders. Just totally fuck. I'm, I'm I'm getting opposition. I've told you that, but I really actually have things scheduled now. When is it? Uh, I've got uh, the MRI uh, Friday. That I've got. Um, you mean like I, today? Like no next Friday. Week, uh, no next Friday. All right. Um, and then I've got uh, the ortho and all the cardiologists and all that other stuff. Because see, when you get a certain age, Connie. It's a big before deal. They, to... Well, before they put that mask on you and they they shoot you up with the Michael Jackson juice. Oh, you uh, you know when you, you reach a certain age and you've had heart attacks such as I've had, and you have the little things in your heart to open it up and all that good stuff. They they tend to be concerned. I'm like, just yeah. look me up, Doc. I just don't want to wake up when you like got my shoulder all like like flayed open. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll be pulling for you. I'm sure Stephanie's got her work cut out for you. You're going to be. Uh, it'll be right before Christmas. Oh, it'll be great for you. So, like, I will be in a great mood and everything. And uh, because it's just my favorite holiday, and I'll have everybody I don't know at my house and all those kind of things. And just, yeah. Well, don't worry. I know just what to get you in time for Christmas a frame uh, picture of my dick. Uh, so, Hey, uh, these original vignettes for Carney, uh, or kids Arnie, is that something you shoot? No, no. Okay. Hell no. By Did that you- time, it was just, you know, just kind of giving input to that, then sending them on their way. I think when you died, right? Like, okay, keep going. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm anticipating what you're going to say, but I don't know what you're going to say. And that was damn rude of myself. So I apologize to you. Well, I know that by the time he debuted on TV, you were already out of there. So, but, yeah. so my question was, did you think when you saw the character and the execution of the character, did you think there was any upward mobility of this? Or could you tell this is going to be one of those things that, man, this might not have legs? Well, I did say this when you died. I just think it was ahead of its time. And I okay. don't know that the audience was ready for it. I don't think that they truly understood it and that they were really ready for, for that character. Well, we uh, we got to talk about another one that maybe was uh, maybe not ahead of the time. <laughs> a Hall of Famer himself, somebody you've spent a little bit of time with, somebody the internet knows maybe too much about. Mr. Tony Atlas was brought back when I was a young man. I didn't see his original run, of course. I wasn't old enough or alive to be watching wrestling then. But when he comes back as Saba Simba, man, it was just for a minute. And what a crazy looking gimmick and get up this was. I guess he's supposed to be an African warrior. Uh, even Roddy Piper on commentary would point out it's actually Tony Atlas. I think his most uh, high profile appearance was the Royal Rumble in 1991. He's going to be around for most of 1991, not really picking up any wins of note or having a notable feud, but he is working a lot with Buddy Rose. What in the world were you guys thinking with? Saba Simba. Well, I'll tell you, uh, I can tell you when and where Saba Simba is 
debut was because it was the first day that I came back into the then WWF at the Hershey Coliseum. Um, and I had gotten there very well, shit. I was, uh, let's be honest. I was scared, uh, coming back into a place that I'd been fired from a year or so, you know, before and not sure how people were going to accept me. I sat out in the arena. I, uh, Bobby Heenan gave me a ride from the Bobby and gorilla gave me a ride from the Hershey hotel to the building. And I said hello to a few people, but Vince had told me, he goes, you know, I'll talk to you when I get there. So I was waiting for Vince to get there. And it, it was interesting because there was reported, you know, a lot of heat with the folks in television and in television production. And I, I believe that, you know, and, and I'm sure there was, by the way, I, I'm, I'm not saying, Hey, I didn't have heat. I had heat with everybody. But at the same time, I will never forget uh, sitting there, and I kind of was sitting there by myself for most of the time, and Kevin Dunn came out of the production meeting to come out and just say, hey, uh, welcome back, and, you know, we've got a seat in here for you if you want to come in and, and you know, and sit in the production meeting now. And I thanked him and I said, now I got to wait for Vince and so on and so forth. But he was the only one that like came out to come and say hello and welcome me back, which I, you know, from the rumored innuendo and probably someone that I, I probably did have heat with uh, that, that went out of his way to come in and say hello. Uh, Bobby and Gino, of course, there, that was, was what it was. So I sat there, Vince came, I met with uh, Vince, John Filippelli, and then we went up and we did the... Uh, John Filippelli is calling you right now. Oh my God, you're right. Uh, I do have to take this though, okay? And we're back, and you were talking about your old personal friend, John Filippelli, before he called, because it was definitely him and yeah. not anyone with WWE. Yeah, and uh, you know, it was what it was and all this stuff, and we go up and have the meeting, and Vince grab me after the meeting. He says, he goes, ah, I want you to you know, watch this and, you know, we we'll talk to you. And so Vince and I sat in the seats, like probably third row or whatever it was. And we're watching as we're seeing the debut and the entrance of Saba Simba. And Saba Simba comes out to new music, this look and everything. And he gets in the ring and he dances around the ring and he takes all of his shit off. And Vince looks at me and says, what do you think? I said, I think it's Tony Atlas barefoot. Well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, it comes out with all this fucking, you know, decoration and all this shit. And then he takes it off and he's wearing blue trunks. And if you were not shooting full body just that's just tony atlas you see the whole thing it's like oh tony's not wearing boots anymore he's like god damn it and he's sitting there staring at him he goes you're right and i'm like yeah so look no matter what you're still tony atlas that's right um so they put some um uh, leopard skin or some kind of, you know, different kind of trunks on him and, and all this stuff. But it was just so the idea was, that you know, Tony had gone back to his roots and that his, his name in Africa was Saba Simba, and that's who he wanted to be and to celebrate that. So, you know, the new look, the new name and all of that. But you, at that point, you realize, hey, we have to explain that this is Tony Atlas and explain all of that versus this is a new character, Saba Simba. It was a new character, Saba Simba, but it was Tony Atlas who became Saba Simba instead of just, well, this is Saba Simba and here's his history. No, it was Tony Atlas who had changed his name to Saba Simba for these reasons. And uh, just, you know, I don't know, just kind of rang flat. Back in 2019, Tony Atlas says that, uh, he got a call 
from the WWE to come in the day after SummerSlam 1990 for a costume fitting. And that's when he learned that, okay, you're not going to be Tony Atlas. You're going to be this Saba Simba character. But he also credits JJ Dillon for coming up with the name saying that JJ had recently taken a vacation to Africa. You think that's real that JJ took a trip to Africa and that's how we yeah. got this. Okay. Yeah. JJ. Uh, so JJ took a trip and this is a trip that I hope to take one day, uh, took a trip to Africa, but he went, he went on a, um, where they go and view the gorillas, the big silverback gorillas and yep. take pictures and stuff. And JJ has some of the most spectacular up close photos of silverback gorillas in the wild I've ever seen. And they're a majestic uh, animal just in general, but I've always been fascinated by silverback gorillas as well. And so, yes, JJ did, and he did go, and he went on this uh, this tour where they went and would go and sit and watch silverback gorillas in their natural habitat and, and take pictures and do all that stuff. Um, it was not a hunting safari or anything like that. It was a, a picture-taking expedition, of expedition that was just absolutely magnificent. And, uh, that's, that's on the bucket list. That one right there. So while he's over there, he just checks out some of the local, uh, culture and see some tribesmen or things. Yeah, he like meant that. Saba and Simba both. Oh, will you stop? No, uh, I really, I, 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 you, you, you scoff. I believe that that was Oh, the name came from meeting real people with. Yeah. Those I yeah. Got I got you. Yeah. Well, I uh, came up with Saba Simba. You know, we've joked about the box of gimmicks before, and I, uh, we've acknowledged that it doesn't technically exist, but if old Tony Atlas could reach in and have his pick, I don't know that he maybe would have picked that, but boy, you can make some money picking this weekend. Uh -huh. Love talking about our sponsors at prize picks. You see, they are the largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform in all of North America. And they're the easiest and perhaps most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. And here's why it's just you versus the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including the pros and the sharks, you just pick more or less on two to six different player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. I absolutely love this. It's super fun. Like for instance, uh, hypothetically, I know Dusty Rhodes, God bless Texas. He was a huge Cowboys fan. Um, he would be, he would like, let me, let me think, let me, let me, let me think. He would like get one of them, one of them Cowboys, like a, let, let's, what could he possibly do if he going to pick Dak Prescott? I want Dak Prescott because he's one of them, one of them Cowboys. Don't want me messing with no Patrick May Homes. We want like Dak Prescott, the Cowboys. What, what can he do? Well, the question might be, is he going to throw more or less than two passing touchdowns this weekend? Ooh, that's it. Less. That's all Dusty's got. Kind of... You're saying yeah. less? Less said, than two I, touchdowns? Have you seen the Cowboys this year? That's Even true, Jerry yeah. Jones is pissed off at him. You know, maybe if it was Mac Jones, they'd have a an over or under for interceptions. Will Mac Jones throw more or less than one interception this week, Big Dust? Oh, I think that's going to be a little bit on the mole side. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you if you looking for more money, you go Mac for more. Mac for more. There you go. Take it from Big Dust. It really is that simple, folks. It's the most fun I've had, winning up to twenty five times my money this football season. You just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and place your entry. That's it, and you get to test your skills this season. And you'll realize that this is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy. You see, if you got the right skills, you can turn 10 bucks into 250 bucks in just a few taps. It really is simple. You make your picks, you submit your entry. That all takes less than 60 seconds. They've even got Apple pay now, so they make it easy to deposit. But more importantly for me and you quick and easy withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types. Can That's I get cool. in on that with my with my good friend Joe Kittle, who's a yes. good friend of this show? Joe, you know, Mr. Kittle, he's a badass. 
All right, then. I ain't mad at it. Listen, he's a tight end. He's eligible. So is your boy, Travis Kelsey. You're probably not a big Kelsey fan, but a lot of Swifties no, are. I like them boys. Like Why them not? Hey, let me just mention this coming Tuesday. They got stuff like Taco Tuesday, where each Tuesday, prize picks will discount certain player projections by up to 25%. That gives you even more value. I also love this policy. Check this out. This is the first time I've even heard of this, Bruce. With Price Picks reboot policy, your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. So for NFL games and the college football top 25 matchups, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and doesn't even come back in the second half, that player is rebooted. Price Picks is the only daily fantasy platform with injury insurance. I love this. I think you will too. It's so fun. It's so simple. You're not playing all the sharks and pros across the world. It's just you and the stats. Do you think they're going to do more or you think they're going to do less? That's it. Go right now and start winning more at prizepicks.com slash wrestle. Use our code wrestle and you'll get a first deposit matchup of up to a hundred dollars. That's prizepicks.com slash wrestle. And the promo code is wrestle. This is prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy, but dusty one last time. Do you think Mac Jones is going to have more or less than one interception? I'm telling you right now, you go Mac for Mo. There you go. All right, because he's going to get he he lacks he lacks the contrast. If he sees another color, it's like ooh, that's a, that's something new. Let me let me let me see if they can catch my ball. So remember, Mac for Mo. There it is. That's my pick. I'm going with it. I love it. Thank you, Dusty. Uh, I don't know how solid advice that is, but check it out for yourself. You'll be glad you did. Uh, Hey, so let's talk about one of uh, Dusty's favorite wrestlers or maybe not so favorite wrestlers because he sure did beat up on him a lot down in the NWA. Talking about our man, Barry Windham. He had not one, but two different gimmicks. I want to talk about both of them. Uh, I had the old Widowmaker trading card as a kid, and I thought, Man, this guy's awesome. And then I had the WCW action figure of Barry Windham as a kid and was such a big fan of his style of wrestling and his look. And as, as, a, as a kid, I had to ask my parents, hey, what's a widow maker? Uh, talk to me about why he couldn't just be Barry Windham. Why did he need to be called the widow maker? What do you remember about that era? Well, look, man, you needed, you needed gimmicks people could understand and people that, you know, Barry Windham's Barry Windham. I'm a huge fan of Barry Windham, the the talent and the human being. Um, I just I think Barry is like one of the coolest guys I've ever had the pleasure to be around and kind of hang out with. Um, but Barry was a little, you know, you know, Barry was one of those guys. The bell rang. Holy shit! Yes. Nobody could touch him. All right, Barry wasn't always the best on promos. But Barry in the back was incredible. I mean, entertaining as hell. So in in trying to think of something for Barry, Barry was the Widowmaker. Yeah. The Widowmaker is a name that they give to the bull that can't be rode. Uh, There's a lot of bulls. You get on that bull, they can strap you in with a bull rope. That's how you know it's a it's a bull rope because it got a bell on it. Go ding a ling a ling. We did this already. We went ding a ling a ling yes. on the bell yes. on your head and go boom ding a ling you out. But the bull that makes it go ding in ling okay. wants to throw your ass off of it. Oh, because bulls don't like to be rode. Got it. So the baddest bull, the bull that cannot be rode. Okay, was the widowmaker. Now, if a cowboy says, I want to be the baddest of the bad, I'm going to ride that Widowmaker. And you know what it does to that cowboy? What's it do to him? It makes his wife a widow. Oh, I got it. Okay. Widowmaker. Understood. Because it can't be rode. So So you get on him and you try to ride, and the bull says, uh uh. Not today. And this is just for trying to ride me, bitch. My oh. wife is now a widow. <laughs> That's why they call him the widow maker. I understand. Bear Wyndham 
Looking at him, you pick him out. Woo! He's the bully of the woods right there, baby. That's a bad man. You want to ride that bull? He's going to make you a widow. Therefore, he is the widow maker. Well, the Widowmaker was not long for this world. He debuted on Superstars June 6th, 1989. And uh, by the time he's supposed to be on Randy Savage's 1989 Survivor Series team, he's already gone from the company. Why didn't it work out? I mean, you've got this guy who you said is just an unbelievable talent once the bell rang. This is certainly the big leagues. I mean, the national spotlight is firmly on the World Wrestling Federation above any other promotion in the world but it's not a good fit for one of the best wrestlers in the world. How does that come to be? I think Barry liked to travel. I don't think Barry liked to travel all that much. And by that point, his career was kind of, nah, a little bit over it. And over so, the travel, you mean over the travel over, over everything just didn't, didn't want to work the schedule that everybody was working at that point. Well, let's talk about the other bite at the apple, uh, because we sort of have, uh, well, I was a fan at the time, but I never really understood the 1996 return. It almost feels like it's sort of Rambo influenced. Maybe Not at all. Military trained or he's a survivalist or, but I know that as you've explained here on the program before, sometimes when Vince has conversations with talent, it sounds something like, tell me about yourself and what are your hobbies and what are your interests and what's your background and what'd you go to school for it? Maybe that's how Paul Bear became Paul Bear. But now Barry Windham is going to become a stalker. Talk to me about this. Barry talking about what he liked to do. Barry had like, oh my God, I don't know how many hundreds of acres of land. Uh, Georgia, uh, Georgia, Florida line. I think that's where it was. And I think we flew into Jacksonville and drove like, 42 hours or some kind of stuff like that to get to his place. But Barry loved to hunt. Barry liked to go out on his land and become one with the land and hunt everything there was from hogs to deer, snakes, whatever was on his land. That was his. And as he was explaining this, he would talk about how he would stalk you know, a deer or a, if he had uh, like a bobcat or a mountain lion or something like that on his, on his land that was eating his, his cows or whatever the hell he had on there, he would stalk that cat and he would, you know, do what he had to do. So the more it was like, he was a stalker. And like, so we went on his, went on his land, which is just all this marshy forest <laughs> kind of thing and, um, shot the, shot the vignettes. And that was, you know, Barry, they never knew he's there. And he scared the hell out of us quite a few times on that. But, um, as we got into it, we had a lot of fun on that and. I thought the vignettes were, were fun and cool. Some of them were terrible, but some of them were cool as shit. It was like looking in the, in the pool in the, in the pond there and it's reflection. And then are you really seeing what you think you're seeing? You pan up and you see that it wasn't exactly what you thought it was. Um, but you know, it, it wasn't, I don't think that Barry, in the ring, transferring from the vignettes to the ring wasn't something necessarily that um, people really got. I liked it. I had fun with it. But um, I also kind of looked at it once we were into it going, this this isn't going to be for very long. Just a feeling I had. He did an interview not too long ago, I think with uh, wrestling shoot interviews, WSI, I think they're over on YouTube. If you want to check those folks out, uh, he said something like I was in a meeting with Vince, Bruce Pritchard or JJ Dillon. And Vince says, I want you to paint your face up. I want you to be a stalker. I was trying to get the idea, but I didn't get it. I tried to skimp on it. I lightened up on the face paint or my cowboy boots under my camo pants, shit like that. He didn't like it. Do you think that was just. Day one, that was always going to be an issue. He didn't really 
like Vince's vision. So maybe it was a half-assed effort or is there another explanation for it? I think, think, look, he was all in, in the beginning. Okay. But, but then it got to the point where, yeah, he was like, yeah, I hate painting all my face. What if I just did a little bit of it? And yeah, he did. He started just not, not being all in. And that's, that's kind of Barry's Barry's MO is that when Barry's tired of do, doing something, he's not going to do it. Um, but it's, it just, you know, that's what it was. And, and eventually I think the most, it, the most fun that, First, I had fun with the stalker with Barry. Good God. Uh, I love doing those vignettes. I loved working with Barry. And then the blackjack stuff with Bradshaw, him and Bradshaw together. I think that Barry was happy working with John big time. They had a lot of fun together as the blackjacks. And, um, you know, that it was what it was. But Barry Wyndham is the soul that, Every, as long as I've known him, he enjoys life. He enjoys living life. It, he's going to go have fun. He is, he, if there's something to do, he's going to do it. And that's the one thing about Barry that I always admired was that he was able to look at any situation and find joy in it and find a, a reason to smile and a reason to, ah, well, well, let's go do this. And, and I thought that was always pretty cool. Like you, you'd be sitting at, at an airport and your flight would be delayed three hours. Barry would take out his phone and, and or I guess they were uh, iPods then. Is that what they called them? It's just uh, music on it. And he, and he would put out little speakers and just chill. You know, boys, what do you want to hear? And he would sit there and just play music and play DJ for everybody. Rather than being frustrated, he made the best of it. Exactly. And I think he did that in in everything in life. Well, that's a great way to live life. I do want to talk a little bit more about the blackjacks because I was such a fan of that. But before I do, I want to mention that in that same interview Barry did recently with uh, WSI, he said something like, they wanted me to work as a baby face, but I'm completely painting my face up. And now you can't really make out my facial expressions. You know, Eric has talked a lot about that, how he wanted to unmask wrestlers, uh, the luchadors, because he wanted to see the expressions on their face. And now you're, you're painting up one of the better baby faces. Do you think that was a valid point or criticism or no? It is, but some people could do it. You know, I look Ray Mysterio wears a mask. I think Ray has one of the most expressive eyes and face of anybody ever in the history of the business. And he wears a mask. So it can be done. I just don't think Barry was comfortable doing it. Before we talk about the blackjacks, because I know that's how he sort of ends his WWF run. I do want to briefly circle back to when he left. I mean, as you take a look in 1989 and that initial run, he's only on a handful of superstars. He never even really makes it all the way to a pay-per-view and he's doing a lot of house shows. And I know that you said, Hey, maybe the travel wasn't for him, but that whole controversy with his family and the counterfeiting scandal that happened in October of 89, around the same time he left. Do you think that played a part in his decision? I do. Okay. Yeah, I do. I I really think, you know, that it did, uh, uh, you know, for those who don't know, there was, uh, Barry's little brother, Kendall and his father, uh, Bobby Jack. We're involved in counterfeiting, uh, I guess, scam or ring, whatever you want to call it, and, and had they were found guilty, and they had to do some time. And I think that the publicity on the family in general, but also, look, man, Barry, Barry loved his brother. Yes. Uh, and, you know, he had a a uh, strange, not an S strange, but a strange relationship with his dad as well. You know, he loved his dad too. He had a great deal of respect and love for his dad too. But at the same time, it was, I don't know that Barry all, was always comfortable being blackjack junior. I totally in get some that. people's mind. And, and Barry Wyndham went out and made a name for himself. And I think he was extremely proud of that. And, 
just didn't want to be in Blackjack Shadow. And and look, a lot of a lot of juniors and a lot of second generation talent can't do that. All right. Barry didn't just do it. Barry excelled at it. And um so yeah, I don't know. It was I, I do think that weighed on Barry a lot. I think, you know, it's a great compliment for him to come over in 89 and largely be unchanged. I mean, if you were watching Jim Crockett promotions or WCW television, and then you are watching superstars and you see him wrestle outside of just adding the widow maker to the front of his name. I mean, it's pretty much the same guy there's no crazy costuming or a total name change or any of that stuff. Uh, and it sounds like he may be left on good terms because you guys welcome him back with the stalker gimmick, but as you said, I don't know that Barry ever left on bad terms. That's great to hear. So when they, when he does finally, uh, sunset, the stalker gimmick, you teased it earlier. I loved the new blackjacks and you and I have talked about this before. I have a theory that if you put the word new in front of a legacy tag team, it's usually snake bit, whether it's the new midnight express or the new rockers, or now maybe even the new blackjacks. But when you talk about two big, badass Texan looking dudes, uh, JBL, uh, and, 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 and Barry Windham, boy, they checked those boxes. I love their style. I, I thought it was believable. It's almost, you could tell that JBL perhaps more even than Barry was borrowing, maybe a little Stan Hansen, but in 1997, it just didn't click. And you had an interesting tag team division. We've talked a lot about Furnace and LaFawn here on the program before, but the new blackjacks, why didn't that work? Was it just Barry wasn't invested or interested in being quote unquote blackjack junior, like you said, or something else? No, I just think the, the gimmick was old. Okay. Uh, I, that's my, that's my impression. Not, I don't think it was the fault of either performer. Uh, I just think that the, that the gimmick itself was old. Will you tell Philip? Well, well, he's calling again. And we're back. Uh, so listen, it, it feels like, uh, you just thought the gimmick was old and I don't know, man, I, I didn't have a lot of familiarity and I think a lot of folks, my age, they didn't really even know about the original black jacks. Maybe we had heard of it, but I just the like, hell did you grow up? Well, I started watching wrestling in 88 and there weren't a lot of black jacks wrestling on TV. They have books. Well, yeah, but the, they the have time, film. That was not readily available back then. If you look for it, you could have found some. I'm just saying. All right. I would love to see your black best of the black jacks tape from RF video in 1988. Sixth generation. Now it's just being nasty. Well, I'm just saying. Uh hypothetically, let's just talk about the 1989 run because I think a lot of people would agree, respectfully, when Barry came back in ninety six, he wasn't exactly the Barry of the mid to late eighties. Um, but in 89, could you have seen him working his way up the ranks in that intercontinental position, maybe battling guys like Bret Hart and Mr. Perfect and Texas tornado and things like that, or was his, um, based on his size, would he have had a, a sniff at some main events? Could you have seen him as a big, mean, nasty heel against a Hulk Hogan for, for instance? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the Barry was that talented. I think Barry was believable in any role that he was in he had the size he had the look and he had the ability well up next is uh Dwayne gill and man he's had uh well a few interesting gimmicks how about number one toxic turtles we briefly talked about this when this first went viral a few years ago on uh the internet wrestling community social media they had one match march 9th 1993 it was a wrestling challenge taping and well, there it was. Toxic Turtles. Talk to me, Bruce. That was a gimmick that Dwayne Gill and Barry Hardy did on the independents. Uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were a big thing. And it was uh, a gimmick they just did. You know, look, something you can never do on a national level certainly wasn't anything we were ever going to do on TV because of the trademark. It was, it was a blatant ripoff, but they had the look, they had the costumes and all that. So for a dark match to entertain the crowd one night, we did it. That's all it was. It was never, never considered for anything beyond that. It was just a 
have some fun in the dark match one night. Let's also mention that, uh, he, he keeps a job. I mean, he's going to stay as a enhancement talent, if you will. And then all of a sudden he gets a big break, maybe accidentally because on the other channel, well, a guy catches fire named Bill Goldberg, and we're going to do a parody of their top star now in Gilberg. And I know that we have talked a lot about punching up and punching down and number one doesn't talk about number two, but maybe when you're battling for that number one spot, maybe it makes sense. Talk to me about how we leaned into the Gilberg character, whose idea that was and whether or not he was up for it and you know, how we got to sparklers in the entrance and the silly tongue. It was fun. Uh, that was Dwayne Gill doing Goldberg. That was, that was him having fun. And then it was like, Hmm, what if he were Gilbert? And, and sometimes things just happen that, that simply. It was just, you know, having a little fun with it. And it was, they had Goldberg and we had Gilberg and let's go have fun with it. He's able to come back as Gilberg in 2003 when the rock is feuding with the real life Goldberg. Uh, did you ever have a conversation with Bill about what he thought about Gilberg? Bill hated Gilberg. Okay. Hated it. Uh, was miserable about it. Didn't, you know, look, Goldberg's first run is, as we've talked about on this show, was not a good one. No. And he was miserable. He, he was angry and not happy and all those other adjectives that go along with that, uh, those descriptors. So, uh, Yeah. Bill didn't like it. Bill didn't like it at all. Uh, and again, you know, look, it's it's parody. It's having fun. If you can't laugh at yourself, then hmm. I laugh at myself <laughs> all the time. <laughs> hey, so um, the real life Dwayne Gill. I've never. I don't think outside of a brief conversation with him, I haven't spent very much time with him at all. How was he to do business with? God. A joy. Great. Dwayne Gill was great. I mean, I, I love Dwayne from, from his days as being an enhancement talent through the Gilbert stuff to this day. Uh, Dwayne is, is just a very personable guy that wanted to be in the wrestling business and was willing to do whatever it took to do that. So, um, you know, I know he had some health issues of late and I saw him after that. Um, but he's, just a wonderful, wonderful guy and loves the business. So from day one, you know, he was always a joy to be around and a joy to do business with. You want you wanted to think of more things for him to do. Let's talk about another guy that we had to think of some things to do. He's still wrestling to this day. Now we know him as PCO, but back then, Jean Pierre Lafette or Lafitte, whatever. Lafitte. Uh, you, uh, you once proclaimed that it's a miracle. He can catch a ball. He's only got one eyeball. Yeah. You can do that. Close your eye and catch a ball. Okay. Here's yeah. set of I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Let's hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me see if I can catch it. I can't yeah, do it. See, it's, can't a miracle. Do it. it's a miracle. But let's do this. Okay. Let's get some dough. Okay. okay, let's put it on one of Dave Silva's eyeballs. And, and then we'll wrap his head, him. and then we're going to throw things at him and see if he can catch it. I like that. Matter of fact, I got something I might throw at him at the end of today's show, so stay tuned for that. But uh, Jean, uh, Carl Ouellette is a okay. modern-day, whatever, is a modern-day pirate. He's got a gloved hand, an eye patch, a mesh tank top, and I guess he is a descendant of an 18th century French pirate. Uh, what? Whose idea is this? A modern day pirate. Who wants to know? I I do. Conrad from Huntsville. He's just wondering how we thought a I pirate. Thought, I heard. I heard that guy died. He's 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 not dead. Oh shit. Okay. Now I think they may have put him in an electric chair on pay per view. But then one of his friends hooked him up to a car battery and then he was okay. It gets confusing, but he's oh, still okay. with us. All right. All right. Um, 
We didn't have pirates, so. <laughs> oh God, that's it. What if we had a pirate? Well, he looked like a, I mean, pirates all had eye patches. Okay, first of all, and and I'm I'm serious in this, in, in that when you're you're looking, and yes, Carl uh, can obviously work without an eye patch. Carl, um, you know, was was only could only see in one eye. He was blind in the other eye, and magnificent athlete and and again you know we we have made light of it but it truly is you know to go through life go go just go one day and try and go through life with only one eye it's not that easy um when you're used to it and he it, it wasn't a handicap for him it wasn't something that debilitated him it was something that he he fought through and he thrived um with that but we thought of it you know i'm looking at that and put an eye patch on him and i think that most people would identify uh an eye patch with pirate back in the day if you're looking at you know you're looking at gimmicks and different things in life and and in the books and what was long john silver and uh what was the one in peter pan captain hook and they all had eye patches they're pirates. So right. if you wear an eye patch, you're a pirate. Copy that. It's it's pretty uh, just it's simple deduction. Well, here's what do pirates do? Well, what do pirates steal, do? They steal leather jackets. They do. Yes. Damn right they do. Yeah. Uh it leads to a match with Bret Hart because he stole Brett's jacket at Victoria! the Meltzer would give it four stars. Uh, I mean, it's a pretty, pretty cool opportunity to be working a pay-per-view with Bret Hart. And I think behind the scenes, maybe he had some issues with the click and the rumor in innuendo was he was hesitant to put over Sean in Canada and eventually agreed, but maybe the click didn't like that. Who knows? But it was diesel. Okay. I guess my question I wanted to ask is. You have said on this program before, and we won't repeat the names, but you've named a few people who you felt like at times, uh, would get in the way of their own success. Mm-hmm. Was he one of those guys or did he make the most of his opportunities and just got a bum ramp? Both. Okay. Uh, both made most of his opportunities, but also could get out of his own way. And I think that it is a, you know, stated a lot. Sometimes people get a territorial in that. Oh my God, you know, I can't lose in Norwalk, Connecticut. They know me there. What? Um, and, and I think that, man, for whatever reason, you know, the, the, a lot of the talent from, from the Montreal, Quebec area, they're, they're, you know, it's good and bad. First thing I got to say is, is that I, I wish that, that our country, was as patriotic as Canada. Overall, man, you, you go to Canada and people love Canada. People support Canada. They, they they get angry when you talk about them in Canada. I think that's a great trait. Um, sometimes it can be a detriment, though. But Montreal is different. Uh, man, the, the, the French cont- Canadian contingent, man, they're just different. And it, it's a... It's a pride, not saying good, bad, or indifferent. Um, but Pat Patterson, one of my best friends in the whole world, and mentor, uh, just look, looked at the world differently than he looked at Montreal. Montreal was, oh, the bad, the kids, the said. Um, and I think that, you know, Carl, Carl looked at that as well and just thought that, no, in Montreal, I walk on water. Mm. Okay, go go walk on a lake, and I'll talk to you on the other side. Um, it just wasn't you know wasn't real. He was a great performer, but sometimes I think took himself a little too seriously. In that, it's you know this this part's real. You know what I mean? Well, man, it's not any more real than everything else. So there there was uh, sometimes that just kind of got in the way. 
Well, here comes a great question, uh, from Thomas J. He wants to know it was stated on commentary at in your house three, that Helen Hart made the leather jacket that was stolen from Brett. My question is, did Helen make all the leather gear for the boys during this time frame? And if so, did diesel get the friends and family discount? Yeah, that, that would be, that would be incorrect. I think that was just part of the story. I, I know I don't, I don't it, is, so. it is hilarious though, because I was this whole time I've been to you like who the shit cares, get down to the Burlington coat factory or hit up the mall and go to Wilson's leather, plop another $300 down and have some goof spray. Not like that. You're not going to get a jacket like that. Ah, well, you, yeah. You run me through there and Michael's give me some glitter guns. I'm good. Nah. Well, I just love the idea that you tried to on commentary. Oh, his mom made it for him. But I mean, I guess you had to have. Okay. Well, okay. You know what? Next time I'm at, at your house. All right. Okay. I'm going to go through one of your 94 closets as you die again. Come on back up, Silva. Where are you? But there you go. Thank you. So I have somebody to talk to there. Okay. And then when Conrad dies again. I'm going to yeah. go through his closet. Oh, actually, he died already. Shit. Damn it. Um, but I'm going to go through one of his 807 closets. Eight, 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 hundred, 808. Okay, 808. Oh, because he, he had to add a closet, folks, just for the jackets that his mama made him. Exactly. And I'm going to take one. And I'm going to wear it all around Huntsville, Alabama. Like, ooh, look at me. I'm special. Look, I got this Conrad Thompson's mama's made jacket. And tell me that he ain't going to get hot. Tell me that. Oh, he, he's going to get Silver. When I he's... say, tell me something, that's your cue to, to tell me what I just said to tell you to tell me. It was a dramatic pause. I was giving okay, you a well, dramatic so pause. Anyway, we, we covered that part of it, Conrad, and we're. We thought you died again. Folks, it's a miracle he's returned again from the dead. Well, I had to lay hands upon upon thee. Like, here, walk here. Put your hand on the TV. <sighs> and put your hand up there. Feel me. Can you feel me, Conrad? No, Conrad, go back to two. Put your hand up there. Can oh, can you feel me? I can feel you. You're I'm alive. You're I can feel that uh, my Firefox has a bad habit right now, but. I just think it's that you know, lamb cable. Not everything in a bad habit is wrong. So instead of a drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit? I like well, Fume can help. They're an innovative award nominated device that does exactly that. You see, in, instead of electronics, Fume, well, that's completely natural. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. And instead of harmful chemicals, fume uses all natural, delicious flavors. You get it. Instead of bad, fume is good. It's a habit that you're free to enjoy, and it makes replacing your bad habit easy. Your fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial, and it's designed with movable parts and magnets for your fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your habit. You're going to love the taste. I know my wife did. She really loved the crisp mint. It shocked her and how flavorful it was, how fresh it was, but they've got a ton of other great flavors too, like white cranberry and maple pepper and sparkling grapefruit and orange vanilla and raspberry lemon. Try them all. You're going to find the perfect one for you. And you're going to love the way it feels in your hand. It's made out of beautiful, beautiful, real wood. It's a cool shape. It's well weighted. It's perfectly balanced. It's just fun to play with, fun to fidget with. See, stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over a hundred thousand customers and has thousands of success stories. And there's no reason that can't be you join fume and accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today, head to tryfume.com and use the code wrestle to save 10% when you get the journey pack today. That's try fum.com and use the code wrestle to save an additional 10% off your order today. That's try fume.com and use our promo code wrestle. Bruce, one of the next gimmicks we've got, boy, it's quite a crazy one. We've talked about it briefly before, but Damien Demento, uh, 
is the idea here he's like this mythical shaman what are we talking about here yeah i don't know that name sounded cool it does sound it was cool. mondo clean before that He's probably most remembered for being defeated by the undertaker in the main event on the debut episode of Monday night raw. And I guess he's going to hang out from maybe the end of 92 to September of 93. And, uh, the rumor is, uh, I guess he did an interview with icons of the ring.com that he got his job with the company after the bushwhackers sent a tape of his work to Vince. Did you see that tape? Do you remember hearing about? this performer i remember hearing about him yeah it, it was uh he was working for the Savoldis, i believe i don't remember the bush why maybe they did i'm not saying they didn't but uh he was somebody that pat and i had seen at a Savoldi show uh working as mondo clean had a unique look and a unique gimmick and thought hey we could do something with this the look i mean he had a great look he really did but um that was kind of about it. He says it was Vincent Pat that came up with the Damien Demento gimmick, and he felt like it was a rib. How's that uh, a rib? I don't know. But he also says he wound up leaving the company because, quote, they never took advantage of me. I lost interest when there was little interest. I mean, why don't, I mean, he does have a crazy look. I mean, he looks like he is an 80s villain. Like, if you were to tell me, Hey, this guy is going to be the bad guy in the next He-Man movie. I'd, I'd have been like, Oh yeah, well that makes sense. Why didn't it work? Is it just the wrong time? Was he a few years too late with this maybe? Well, for those of you watching on YouTube, you could see what he looked like, but then he took that stuff off and the bell rang and that kind of explains it all the rest of it. I got you. I understand. Well, let's talk about somebody we both think a lot of John Tenta. He's going to get one last bite at the apple with you guys as Golga. He's, uh, I mean, how would you even describe this character? He's wearing a, a leather mask and sweatpants and a Cartman t-shirt. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know he's part of the oddities. He's going to be paired with like giant Silva and Kurgan and originally the Jackal who we know is Don Callis and He's going to brush up against the Howard Stern whack pack, but I don't know. I mean, he had such a great run as earthquake putting him under this tan mask and sweatpants and a Cartman t-shirt. What'd you think? Not crazy about it. You know, this was during Russo's infatuation with Howard Stern and the whack pack or whatever the hell they were. And you know, put together the oddities and whatever with Don Callis. And it was, uh, Hey, their, their entrance was over. Um, yeah. thanks to I, I, insane clown posse. Maybe, you know, uh, Kurgan, I think Robert Malay is, is, uh, you won't find a nicer guy in him as well. And, it just was, you know, we had the giant Silva who we were trying to see if there was anything there. And, you know, Russo grouped everybody together and Tenta was, was looking for work at the time. And I don't think that he was, you know, was, you could see he had lost quite a bit of weight as well. And was it, you know, he really wasn't the earthquake anymore. But um, here was an opportunity to, to do something with him and make a unique thing that in the mask, there was supposed to be like a big giant uh, bulge coming out of the mask. It's kind of there, but it's just not as pronounced as we wanted it to be. We wanted it to be like this guy has this big deformity on the top of his head. But it... Um, he was supposed to be the heater of the group. He was supposed to be the serious one because he was the best worker by far. And it's just the goofiness of it just did not work. It really didn't. I felt bad for John because again, you know, you, there's guys in the business that um, are just so, so damn nice. And, you know, John was a nice guy, but he was also a talented son of a bitch. And the earthquake thing was a huge deal. And 
you know, a little earthquake, I don't know, would have been as effective as when he was as big as he was when he was earthquake. Right. So it was an attempt to try and do something new with him and it just didn't work. Let's talk about Cartman for a minute, because I know at, at different times in this era, we would see the new age outlaws where South, South Park characters on their shirts. But I mean, we just saw over on YouTube, if you're watching at something wrestle.com, He's not only got Cartman on his t-shirt, but he's bringing a Cartman doll to the ring. And that's not necessarily one of your licenses. And, you know, usually I'm, I'm conditioned to think, okay, like, uh, we can't have any other brands on these characters because we want to put them in all of our marketing and advertising and licensing and video games and action figures. How, how were you able to do that? Why was Vince comfortable with that? Why did Vince allow this? Did you have an agreement or an arrangement with Comedy no. Central? Or it was Vince Green? Russo's infatuation with South Park. That's all it was. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there, no, there was no other story to it. It had nothing. And it's also why it stopped, because there's, there's nothing there. There's Right. You can't make money with it. You can't why would you do this? It's stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of stupid, uh, we got one of the world's best wrestlers, uh, the real life Darren Matthews. Uh, we know him as, uh, oh, you mean the man's man, or Steven Riggle. Yeah. The real man's man. He's a man. He's a man's man. And is he a man of a man's man? Uh, I guess he's supposed to be the typical working class American complete with the construction hard hat, the flannel Have you ever shirt. seen him squeeze an orange? No. Okay. Well, squeezes it like a real man. All I'm saying. He looks like the construction worker from the village people in this outfit. Yeah. Like a man's man. Well, I mean, talk me through this. You've got one of the best wrestlers. I mean, did you not, did Vince not think that, that you could monetize that? We can't just keep, I'm just wondering like, what's the thinking and okay for Barry Wyndham, it ain't broke. We ain't going to fix it. We're going to just give him a little gimmick name in front of his name, but pretty much keep him like we had him. Why not just bring him over and let him do that character here, as opposed to let's put him in a flannel and a hard hat. Because I think when you look at William Regal, you, you see a very proper and everything other than the rugged type. So if he claims to be the rugged type, when he doesn't look like the rugged type, that's heat. And if he doesn't look like the everyday guy, but yet he is telling you he's just an everyday guy, that's the philosophy behind the character. Well, his vignettes would include him uh, chopping wood, shaving with a straight razor, and as you mentioned, squeezing his own manly heart. stuff. I assume you shot these. No. Okay. Um, I wasn't in favor of it, but you know, you weren't in favor of. No, this I hate it. I think everybody did. Like I can't try as I might. I can't imagine this guy ever wrestling Stone Cold Steve Austin in this era. Yeah, it was not good. He's only in the gimmick for a few months before he has some uh, personal issues. He winds up leaving the company in April of uh, 99. Let's talk about another really short term character key. Uh, if you were a fan of ECW or you watched any independence like XPW, maybe you've heard the name Vic Grimes before key is a drug dealer, or at least that's the way I felt about it. I assume since he's out here in all white and his name is key, he's going to debut in a match alongside Prince Albert and draws. And they even sort of say the name key is based on, you know, a kilo of cocaine. I know we're trying things in uh, the attitude era, but my goodness key. Wow. We're, uh, we're reaching rotten, now. rotten, horrible, yeah. hated it. Drizzling shits. How does it get greenlit? If you feel so strongly respectfully, I'm asking. Uh, it was something Russo wanted to do during a, during a period where, you know, Vince was involved in other things and, and not, you know, Russo would only explain certain things that he thought he could get past. And there you go. Horrible, rotten, drizzling shits. I thought Vic Grimes had some talent and could have been that, that wild and crazy guy to 
work with Mick and, and in that style, but also find his own way. Maybe it was the fact that we had Mick, you know, already and you don't really need you know, to but you didn't need two of them and everything and he wasn't as good as mick nobody but was. he was crazy and i just thought that the the character there's nowhere to go with it it was lowbrow it was something you don't want to do and or touch and you know we did it for a few weeks and it stunk well we know that uh he has all of one match on TV, August 8th, 1999 on shotgun Saturday night. It's reported that the fact that, uh, the Godfather got hurt is the reason the gimmick was shelved. Um, this Vic Grimes always seemed like he had heat though. I mean, it was reported back when he had a dark match in January of 98, he wrestled Aaron O'Grady, who, uh, we know was going to become, uh, a cousin of Bob Holly, hardcore Holly. They find themselves in developmental and Grimes had a lot of size and for, for that size, a lot of agility, but the rumor and innuendo was in the dark match. They go out there and just do one spot after another, rather than having a quote unquote, WWF style believable match, match is yes. what you're saying. They, they went out and did spot monkey stuff. So he starts with that. And then I guess as soon as he gets on TV, unfortunately, Godfather gets hurt. Does it feel like his run here was just snake bit from the start? I don't know if it was snake bit or if it was just exposed more than okay. anything. You know, it's it's a lot of times, you know, guys will, hey, look at how good I can work. I could do all these things, whether they're logical, or they mean anything, you know. Hey, show me how you can sell. That'd right. Be something different. Show me that you could tell a story in a match versus just doing maneuvers and not selling anything and popping right back up and, and doing nothing. Um, and I think it just was exposed that, okay, you know what? He, d- he didn't learn anything in Memphis and this isn't going to work. And next. Well, let's talk about somebody that I'll be honest. I don't even really remember that much. Just Joe. Yeah. It's just Joe supposed to be a, a regular guy. Who's got unremarkable traits and. He's a shit stirrer who antagonizes wrestlers backstage and then occasionally steps in the ring. And when you hear a character like this, it makes me think this is a rib on someone in real life. There's somebody who rubs somebody the wrong way. And they said, I'm going to write this guy to do this kind of shit. Is that the way that goes down? No. Well, well I know Joey, we- Leg- Joey legend was, was just Joe and a uh, good worker. He was a friend of edge and Christian and from from canada great guy man i I like joe a lot and the the character was based on these guys and a lot of times an enhancement talent or somebody that um (laughs) that always has to come up and introduce themselves nine times or shake your hand and thank you nine times when it's like oh hey man you know, good to see you. I saw you earlier. Hello again. Or yeah. Hey, hi, how you doing? Um, and it was, it was kind of based on that kind of a, of an annoying person that doesn't know how annoying they are. That kind of sticks their nose and everything when you're talking and you're in the middle of a, uh, you're in the middle of a meeting or something, and you're having a discussion with someone, and somebody just comes and hangs out. Like, you need something? Oh, hey, no, hey, hey, how you doing? Just Joe. Um, because we all know those people. They're in everybody's life, and that that's what the character. No, it was actually it was an opportunity in looking at Joe, and he could work, he could go. And to really make him this annoying character that could then pretty much find his way into any, any issue in any program and then be able to go in the ring. So I don't know why anybody would think it's a rib. If they it, look, if he thought it was a rib, then that's probably why it came off shitty. Well, no, I'm not saying he thought it was a rib. I'm saying it felt like someone wrote the character. Like it was a rib, like, it feels like somebody who's just disturbing shit and is just Joe. Like, I don't know. Um, I, I do remember Joe E legend and certainly reading about him a lot in those, uh, uh Canadian independence with not only, as you said, edge and Christian, but Rhino and 
he did get some uh, TV time with S.A. Rios and Steve Blackman and even the Brooklyn Brawler, but uh, maybe yeah, he's... I will just... say that, that this was also kind of the era. And this, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you'll have comments about this, but there was there was a period, a um, several, couple different periods, where I would get a little upset when, when Jr would go to a developmental and tell guys, oh, God damn, y'all are all, everybody looks the same. Y'all got your long hair and your beard. God damn, cut your hair. look like a man. And so coming from Jr, guys do it. all go get haircuts. So now they all look the same. They yes. all get the exact same haircut. And there was no differentiating them. Sometimes, you know, a guy with long hair and a beard, you can cut that, but you can't grow it back overnight. Nowadays, you can with extensions, but but that used to as a bit, chill, dude. Stop telling them that because we can cut their hair, but we can't grow it back. There's a guy with a unique look with long hair, and if everybody has short hair, then that long hair guy looks different. But not everybody in life, to be a man, has to have a short haircut. And, you know, that was a, a point of contention. And, and it got to the point. And, and later on, you know, Lauren Ida, she used to go down and, and the guys he would pick and tell everybody to get haircuts. And they would all get haircuts. And they all looked exactly alike. And it's like, dude, let fuck, let us do that. Let us create that look versus just giving us Joe generic on everybody and everything. You know, if, if we want Joe generic or we want a different look, man, we can cut their hair to that point. Um, shave their beard, whatever you want to do. But it's hard to grow it out. Um, so th those are things that's just kind of my pet peeves that, that just kind of would, would get under my skin a little bit. And I say that because Joey legend had this long flowing hair and then he comes up one day and he looks like Joe average. Right. Um, so I don't know. I, 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 this is just one of my pet peeves that I know he was, he was in that group, you know, of cut your hair. So he cut his hair. And I was like, Oh, that looks like shit. And you're envisioning him the whole time as this guy with the long flowing hair as you're, you're developing things. And then somebody says, well, you know, you should cut your hair. Look like a man and look like an athlete. Look like a fine young man. Well, not everybody are fine young men. And it's okay to look different. Let's talk about uh, what could have been uh, for Joey legend, his pals, edge and Christian, once they're in, they get a tape of some of his matches to Terry Taylor. Taylor calls him in for a tryout and they offer him a spot in a, a member of like the remake of the new fabulous Freebirds trio where Michael Hayes was going to be a manager. And according to the rumor and in innuendo, Michael decides he'd rather be an agent and the idea falls by the wayside. Do you remember there being discussion? of a new fabulous free birds. And maybe Joe could have been a part of that. No. Okay. Uh, it's also said in an interview, he said that he once sat down with you, Vince and Linda. And in the meeting, he pitched you guys on being, uh, a gimmick that was inspired like a, a cult leader, maybe like a David Koresh type. And the idea being, he would say something like, don't blame me. I'm just the messenger. Do you remember the gist being as this shit disturber, he's trying to be a cult like leader as a fan at home. I never really got that vibe. I, that was his, no, that, that's what he saw. Okay. And I do remember that pitch. Absolutely. But it just didn't, you know, didn't work. We were trying to get the just Joe, the shit disturber. If we got to that guy that was looking for disciples under him. Yeah, we could have got there, but we had to get just Joe over first. Well, let's talk about just the heartthrobs, um, Antonio Thomas and Johnny Roselli. These are over the top lady killers who have, uh, a pelvic thrust on their way to the ring to some obnoxious dance music. And 
I guess the team was originally called the heartbreakers, but with Shawn Michaels on the roster, you can't really do that. Bruce, in your own words, can you sort of explain to us what the heartthrobs gimmick was? And maybe can you tell us how Vince might've described it at the time? Not a fucking clue. All right. Like, you know, and, and again, uh, I'll, uh, it's a sound disparity. I don't mean it this way. I couldn't pick them out of a lineup and I know they were there during time that I was there, but it was two guys that I, I guess were doing a dance gimmick that I don't know. I guess they were heartthrobs. I don't know. Um, but uh, it never, it never really got over to the point where, oh my God, you got to do something with these guys. They were, there were a couple guys on the card that would have an okay match and you could beat. Well, they had quite a bit of success in OVW. And when they finally get the big call up, their debut is on raw in Madison square garden. Uh, they do lose to the tag team champions at the time, Regal and Tajiri, but still, uh, that's gotta be pretty cool. Your first time on TV is uh, for the tag straps in MSG. Uh, maybe something that was a little less cool. One of your great close personal friends who was trying to make some chicken salad. We're talking about your pal Chavo Guerrero when he tried to be Kerwin White. This feels like maybe one of the worst ideas out of the old box of gimmicks. It's supposed to be, I suppose, a generic middle-class white man with anti-Hispanic racist undertones. He's wearing a button down shirt and sweaters tied around his neck. And he's always got khakis and he's even dying his hair blonde. He's driving a golf cart to the ring. And he even has a caddy who's known as Nick, who we know later is going to be Dolph Ziggler. Dude, what in the world were you thinking with Kerwin white? Surely this isn't your idea. No, but it was, it was basically taking Chavo and who Chavo was and putting that on camera. And what I mean by that is, is that in the stereotypical world in which we lived, you have to look at the, the era. Okay. And don't look at this through 2023 lenses. You have to look at it at the time that it was in which you would look at, at Chavo. You, you would look at wrestlers a lot of times and Chavo like had, you would look at him and go, that guy, not in this business, you know, um, beautiful wife, beautiful family, just uh, about as average American as you could possibly get. But yet, with very strong Latino roots, his, his father being an absolute, you know, walking, talking legend, uh, and Chavo Guerrero Sr., uh, his grandfather just revolutionized the business just for what he did his work in Mexico and El Paso Juarez that area and everything and uh Gory Guerrero one of the greatest of all times but then also producing uh <laughs> a, a legacy after him of some of the greatest wrestlers in Mondo and Chavo and Hector and Eddie and then you know Chavito from Chavo uh, but it was, he, he, there, there was an averageness about him that, you know, tried to, I, I think it was way too far in the, uh, in the, the undertones, if you will, um, that again, you couldn't get, you couldn't get away with today and is in poor taste, probably in poor taste then as well. But it was, that was the idea behind it. Cause you, you know, Chavo came in, I, you know, I don't think in my entire life, and I've known Chavo since he was a kid. I, I don't ever, you know, like some guys come in and, and, and look like they just came out of, out of, I don't know, a trash bin or something like that after working out in the gym and Chavo always dressed to the nines. Coming out of the gym, the son of a bitch looks like he's ready to walk into a boardroom. You know what I mean? Right. Um, you know, it's hard because he's his dad was very close to his father and, and his uncle. Um, but him too. And, and it's hard because I love him so much. He was excellent. I think that uh, 
he look, I thought he portrayed Kerwin White exactly as you know everybody saw it. But I just don't think that it was one that had any longevity to it and and in the best taste. Well, we know that uh allegedly it's based on Kerwin Silphies, at least the name. Do you think that's the way that oh, goes? it's like the first name from Kerwin Silphies because it just sure. sounded nerdy. We know that it, the whole thing gets dropped after Eddie Guerrero's death. Uh, nobody could have ever predicted that. But uh, Chavo sat down with our pal Chris Van Vliet not too long ago, and he said that his idea was maybe a little extreme. Quote, I told Vince at the end of the day, I want to come out in a white sheet. He said, oh, yes, I love it. Now, we never ended up doing that. It got too risque, a little too racist for a network. I wanted to, Absolutely. I grew up in the time of wrestling where the more heat, the better. I wanted to fight my way back to the dressing room every night. I wanted to have to sneak out the back window. I wanted to be in the streets and people yell, we hate you because that's heat. If I was going to do it, I wanted to do it a hundred percent. Like I would do anything else. We never got to that point, but I was ready. I would have, I mean, boy, in hindsight, I'm really glad you guys never presented a Klansman on. TV. Oh my God. Never in a million years. No. My God. Wrong kind of heat. Wrong kind of heat, indeed. Bad now, heat. No. If you're, if you're looking for the right kind of heat at your house, can I recommend Manscaped? Yeah, come on now. We've been brought to you by Manscaped, and they are taking a step up from Balloween to bring you the cleanest shave it's ever seen. See, there's no reason to toil and trouble. Manscaped's all new handyman is the best way to get rid of that stubble. Featuring a compact design and next generation skin safe technology, the handyman was designed to give you that smooth finish without the mess of a traditional shave. Get the sweetest treat this Halloween by going to manscaped.com and using the code STW for 20% off plus free shipping. It may be spooky season, but you won't have to scare people with a scraggly beard. Give them something to look at with Manscaped's handyman. Are you tired of a bad razor making your neck look like a scary movie? With the handyman skin safe technology to help reduce nicks and cuts, you can finally feel confident when going for that close shave. It's for wet or dry use, so feel free to bring it anywhere and everywhere. It's got a compact design, and the airplane friendliness makes it the perfect travel tool for on the go. And being able to shave up to three days' growth without the mess of a wet shave is priceless. For my wolf man with a little more scruff, can we recommend Manscaped's Beard Hedger Pro Kit? It has everything you need to tame your mane. Their cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel that's going to give you 20 different hair cutting links with just one guard. That's right. Halloween costumes may take effort, but beard grooming doesn't need to, especially when you can get 20 different beard links with just one guard. The Beard Hedger is a high tech piece of art in a travel size package with a long lasting battery, universal charging, and a strong motor. There's no trick with this treat. Manscaped has you covered. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code STW at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use the code STW for a look as sweet as candy. Get yourself the handyman from Manscaped. Let's talk about a couple other talents here. We've never talked about as far as I can recall. Deuce and Domino, their pal, Jerry. What's that? I said, there's a reason we've never talked about them before, but go ahead. Why is that? Well, what's there to talk about? I mean, they, they were very short lived gimmick. It was a gimmicks gimmick. Um, it just, it, you know, really didn't, didn't work. And I think that it was, uh, real deal. Why do we never try to lean into Jimmy Snuka jr? We did. Okay. We did. I mean, later on, we brought him out as his real name, Sim Snuka. And I mean, but here, why did they do second that? generation? Did you not think he could live up to, to it as a debut? Absolutely not. Okay. You ain't oh, my get God, no. No. You know, I go back to when Jimmy Snuka, famous story. Snuka walks out of the WWF back in the day, and they're in Madison Square Garden. Jimmy's, Jimmy's gone, and they have Howard Finkel go out, and Howard – goes to introduce and now from the Fiji islands hit music and all this shit. 
and this fucking guy comes to the ring and they've got fire dancers on so see me offy and a universal fart in church oh this guy's out there doing a fire dance doing all this shit maybe even more athletic than jimmy um maybe i don't know if he's been a worker or not but um he wasn't jimmy snooker and jimmy had made such an impression on the audience of those that had ever seen him live or via videotape on your television screen. Jimmy was a unique, very unique talent. And I dare say that nobody has ever been able to replicate, duplicate that charisma and that, that aura that Jimmy Snuka had. So, to bring him in is Jimmy Snuka Jr. Plus there's baggage with Jimmy Snuka. But it, it he could never, to those that love Jimmy Snuka in the ring, that character Jimmy Snuka, I dare say there could never be anyone that could match that charisma and that connection with the audience. And to try even with his own son, uh, it just, it was something that, a shadow that I don't know that anybody could ever get out of. I totally get it. It's uh it's that trap that a lot of second generation, as you say, fall into, but I am curious about why are we, I mean, this feels like it's out of the movie Greece or the TV show. Happy days. Is this, is this a Jim Cornette idea? I mean, what it was something that was started in OVW and it was kind of a, you know, um, I say cute gimmick, but okay, let's, let's try it. It was different throwback, but it just didn't, you know, was what it was. And, and that's, there's a time limit on those kind of gimmicks that you can only do for so long. And I, I think that's what we found out. Cherry, of course, is alongside them. Eventually they split with her, pick up Maurice, but that only lasts for about a month. Then they turn on each other. Uh, it's interesting to see how some of these second generation things work out so well and others, maybe not so much. Um, what'd you think of cherry? Any good stories you can share? We, I don't think we've ever even said her name on the show. Uh, you know, other than dealing with her, I have. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there are any, none that I know of anyway. Well, next up somebody who's had plenty to say about you over the years, but, uh, I'm sure, uh, it's all water under the bridge now. Simon, I, I, which I don't get. I, I don't. I mean, I can't really recall other than doing uh, work with him in Houston one time at a Burger King for the cheeseburger. I don't remember dealing with this guy at all. He was in the office. I I have no idea what what his issue is. Um, I, and and again, I'm not saying this in, in a mean way, but I got asked. Uh, in one of those first thing that comes to your mind, you know, Conrad Thompson, I say acres of, oh, listen, 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 but they, they asked me, they said, Nova. And I said, who, I, I don't know who that was. I did oh, not, I, I did not know who he was at all. Um, and then I heard that he had said all this shit about me. So I have nothing to say about him because, I don't ever really recall interacting with this guy for him to say anything bad about me. So I, I couldn't care less. You want to ask me about the gimmick? I thought the gimmick um, was Skippy light from the body Donna's. Uh, it was supposed to be like a Jack LaLanne right. type gimmick for those that know who Jack LaLanne is. Uh, but I just, you know, I never really saw, I just never really saw much in him as a, as a human being. I can't even tell you that I had more than, you know, passing conversations with him at work. So, well, I'll um, tell you these days, he's uh, doing a lot of charity work. He's got, he's good for moved, him. moved on with his life doing uh, the banking biz, I think in Kentucky, uh, super fun, banking? super positive. Banking, you know, like you know, you give your money oh, there. Banking, I thought you said check. baking, like you know, no. the bake off or something like no, that. There's an N in there. My bad. I'm a hillbilly. Well, 
but yeah, listen, I think maybe that's, maybe we got to the root of it. And I just want to give context when you said who to Nova, um, I got you. That, was, that was after this guy had already said all this shit about me. Well, I just want to give context because when you're like who to Nova, you once received a phone call from K dog, not realizing it was your old friend, Charles, the real life Conan. It happens. You don't necessarily consume every bit of wrestling content out there. And if someone has a gimmick name that you didn't follow in that territory, that era of your career, I could see how that would happen. But of course, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, as I recall, I think once upon a time, uh, Mr. Bucci sat down with uh, Rob Feinstein and did a shoot interview. And he had a famous saying that, boy, it was repeated a lot when we started our podcast. I'd take a bullet for Tom and put one in Bruce. I think yeah, I didn't know the guy. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure he regrets that now. He's a different, uh, who cares? Like the- I am. Oh, <laughs> you are. That hurt. Oh, bang. Uh, next up, we got Sil- it, hot shot. Sylvain, he's going to be the ambassador at large for the beautiful P- province of Quebec. Uh, he is uh, an ambassador of Quebec, spreading the virtues of Canada's most beautiful province to anyone that would listen. You're trying him again after La Resistance, but you know, he's got this supermodel look and maybe a gimmick there. And then we're going to try this ambassador of Quebec. This just feels like we're grasping at straws, just bad timing. Yeah. You know, I mean, the gimmick itself actually, you know, not even going through this, but it was, uh, as I told you earlier about Quebec, Montreal, that, that this was a perfect example of that kind of feeling that those from Quebec have and perfect gimmick, perfect gimmick for him, because that's, he was one of those guys that, ah, oh, well, Montreal, it's a say it's a pay. Tap of that. Um, shit like that. I don't even know what tabernacle means. But I don't know either. I think it's like a, a either like a goddamn or something like that. But I like saying it because it sounds funny. And every time I say it in in Montreal, everybody looks at me like, you know, ah, I don't pay. Such a tabernacle, get the chase. Um, and they understand me for some reason. I have no idea what the hell I'm saying. Ah, kiss to say tabernacle. That's all I know. And maybe somebody can fill us in on what the hell I just said. Kiss Maybe it's like hello or goodbye or fuck you or I don't know. Let's run through a few other gimmicks that aren't necessarily bad, but they were different. The smoking guns. You got two cowboys firing pistols before their matches. What'd you think of the cowboy tag team gimmick? You like that one? I did. I love them. Um so they came to us uh from Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly, we had brought on as a as a commentator from Eddie Mansfield's group in Orlando, Florida. They're taping at Universal Studios. And Kevin, I said, hey, there's, is there any talent down there? And he says, yeah, there's these guys who do a cowboy gimmick. And saw them. Great, man. You talk about deceptively big. Bart Gunn and Billy Gunn were, man, those guys are huge. And had a nice, nice gimmick. And... Like, let's keep it on. We didn't have any cowboys. Let's have a couple smoking guns. I thought it was fun, and I thought they they made the most out of it, at least. And then, uh, you know, went their separate ways and found out Bart was badass with a pair of gloves. And Billy's just Billy. Billy's fucking awesome. He's, he's an ass. Mr. Ass, by God, to you. Podcast Heat is teaming up with 14-time women's world champion Charlotte Flair to help raise money for Smile Train. And you have the chance to participate and win a personalized autographed photo and a 15-minute private video chat with the queen herself by being the highest donor. With your donation, Smile Train can provide life-saving surgeries and other essential cleft care to children in need 100% free. A donation of $21, less than your weekly Starbucks, can provide one cleft repair surgery. Without treatment, children with clefts may struggle to breathe properly, often becoming severely malnourished due to trouble eating, and many face long-term psychological trauma as a result of relentless bullying. 
No child deserves to feel like an outcast. Join Smile Train Global Ambassador Charlotte Flair in becoming a champion of smiles. Your donation will provide the gift of cleft treatment. Donate today at smiletrain.org slash Charlotte. And remember, the highest donor will receive a personalized autographed photo and a 15-minute private video chat with Charlotte. Together, we can change the world one smile at a time. The body Donna's your brother, Tom was zip. Chris Candido was skip. Then I guess that was cloudy. Of course, Sonny's in on the gag. You sort of talked a little bit about this with, uh, the Simon Dean system, but did you think that character could have worked? I mean, as a tag team, did you like I that? I thought they did work. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they did work. They were a heat seeking, uh, tag team, you know, skip and it, it run his course with Sonny as a single. And as a tag team, I thought it was a damn good tag team. Yeah. It was a gimmick, but I thought it was a good gimmick. Waylon mercy. That's a character that Dan Spivey tried and you know, it felt like maybe it would serve as inspiration for Bray Wyatt and the Wyatt family later. I think maybe just bad timing on that. Maybe he was on the downhill slope of his career and maybe the gimmick was ahead of its time. The gimmick was a play on Robert De Niro and Cape fear and, right. uh, Spivey's promos, all that shit, man. Holy cow. I mean, it gave you chills because Dan could deliver it. Dan could, Dan did the gimmick extremely well and people didn't, didn't go back to Dan Spivey because you think of Dan Spivey with the long blonde hair and the, you know, the yellow tights and all that shit. Um, and Dan was a legitimate badass. But Dan also had a lot of injuries at the time. He was fighting injuries. So it, it wasn't, Dan wasn't at his peak physically. I think that the character, uh, I thought the character had had legs, but unfortunately, you know, I think Dan's legs kind of, you know, were given out on him. Uh, realistically, um, his knees were bad. He was, he was hurting. So it was just, it was just time, but had we been able to do that gimmick, even two years earlier, I think that he would have had a much longer run. I loved it. I thought he played it perfectly and, and it was believable because Dan believed it. So he was Waylon Mercy. That was the difference. He, he became that person. What about your old pal, Michael Hayes? When he comes over, we can't just let him be Michael Hayes. Now he's got to be doc Hendricks. Why not just keep him as Michael Hayes? Cause doc Hendricks was cooler. We didn't want Michael Hayes. Oh, okay. we didn't want a free bird. We needed it. Hey. We needed a, we needed a color guy. We needed somebody in the, uh, the zone where the hell we called it at that time to do that. And it wasn't Michael Hayes. It was Doc Hendricks, and he became that character. And look, man, I thought Michael embraced that. Michael fucking took it and ran with it. 1996 is a year where a lot of gimmicks are uh, being tried out in the WWF. Year of the gimmick. The Godwins with Hillbilly Jim, Al Snow as Avatar, uh, and then Leaf Cassidy as part of the new Rockers. Bill Irwin is the goon. Uh, we've even got Tom Brandy as Salvatore Sincere. Alex, the pug Parto. any of these good ideas at any point. Do you think every one of them, you forgot oh, TL Hopper. Oh man. Who, who could forget old TL Hopper all, all based in reality. The pug was a, was a shooter, little shooter gimmick, uh, which is what Alex Porto, he was an amateur wrestler and that's what they called him in amateur wrestling, uh, was a pug. And so we took that and, and used that. Tony Anthony was actually working as a plumber oh. at the time. So we made him a plumber on TV. So like, you know, people say, oh, he made up these. Things. No, that's who they were. Bill Irwin in school played hockey and was the goon. The guy that went into the game to get in fights with the other team. That was his job. They call it the goon. Got he it. actually did that. He that's what he was in real life. Sal Sincere was a phony Italian. Eh, had a face, had chase. Um, so it's it's not a far reach. You're looking at you're looking at trying to take things from their past and 
you know, amplify them and make them into gimmicks and larger than life characters. So some win, some don't. We, uh, we should hit a few questions here. Instagram, a wrestling historian wants to know what was the expectation with Fantasio? <sighs> to do magic in the ring, okay. to do illusions in the ring. I wanted him to make people disappear. He couldn't do that, but I wanted, you know, like, uh, I don't know, man, pull doves out of somebody's ass or something like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Out something. Of their ass. something. Okay, give me some David Copperfield. Give me something that, that I can relate to. But all he could do was pull all the shit out of his mouth and set my fucking gorilla position on fire. Uh, FF Handbook wants to know, is there a rule of thumb on how many times a talent can be repackaged into a new gimmick? Godfather, Kane, and Rikishi took a bunch of tries to get it right. How do you know which people to keep repackaging and which to future endeavor? I think... You know, it comes down to talent. It comes down to the human being and in their willingness. Look, you know, Kane, good God, we did Isaac Yankum, we did Diesel until we found Kane. And we and we thought Kane was pretty much a one off for The Undertaker. But it was Glenn Jacobs that made the Kane character work. And Glenn Jacobs, the human being that we really wanted to create something that would work for him. With Rikishi, uh, the same thing. You know, he had been the Sultan. He had been uh, Fatu. And here was an opportunity. And I'll never forget flying down to Memphis to pitch him on this. And Vince had pulled me in one day. He says, uh, Junior. And he says, what if he bleached his hair blonde and he did the sumo gimmick? I think he could pull that off. And I went down, and, and obviously, you know, Junior was uh, very hesitant because of Yokozuna. And he was like, I don't want to be, you know, Yoko Light or anything. And I said, not going to be Yoko Light. You're going to be Rikishi. And he fought it at first. But then, um, and, and the other condition was you're not going to wear the tights like uh, Yoko did. That's going to make you different in and of itself, too. You know, you're going to wear the diaper, like the, the sumo gimmick and took a little talking into, but by God, you know, it, it, it made him. And I think that's what people remember him for. Um, it just depends on the human being. If they're, if it's in them, then you keep, you know, you keep pushing, you keep trying. And, and if they, if they put everything into what they're given, then that tells you, okay, maybe that didn't work. Well, by God, you know, not their fault. Let's let's try something else. The Rosen Coaster wants to know: Was there ever a gimmick that Vince pitched that he absolutely loved, but unanimously everyone else in the room hated? But you had to go along with it anyway because he's the boss. Oh, there's a ton of them, and when you ask that question, I say there's a ton of them, and then I go back, and go, okay. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but there are, there are a lot of them that just were like, what? Oh no, please stop. Francis Reyes wants to know, was there any gimmick that you think could have turned around with a little more time? I mean, again, same thing. I, I I'm sure that I'm sure there are. Um, and, and sometimes it's a gimmick. It's just timing of when that gimmick is out. Um, look, you know, I'll, I'll use brother love as an example. Do I think that brother love could have lasted as long as he did had the Jim Baker and Jessica Hahn scandal not happened three weeks after I debuted? I don't think it could have. I, you know, I, I wonder about that all the time. It's timing. And the fact that I debuted on TV and whatever it was three weeks later, the biggest televangelist in the world, Jim Baker, gets caught sleeping with the secretary, Jessica Hahn, and there's a huge scandal. And now you've got a guy on TV called Brother Love, who is over the top televangelist, you know, ripoff. Um, timing was everything. And I think that helped. So sometimes 
you'll put a gimmick out. Maybe it's too soon or too late. And for whatever reason, doesn't work. Adam wants to know, is there a reason why Vince had so many occupations as gimmicks? How much of a kick did Vince get from the name Isaac Yankum DDS? And if someone else played the undertaker, would it have been on this podcast? Um, again, you, you call them occupational gimmicks. I, I don't call them occupational gimmicks. I call them an extension of what they truly were. And Paul Bearer was a mortician, a licensed mortician. Um, like I said, T.L. Hopper was actually a plumber. Uh, it's just an extension of who they were. Big Boss Man was a prison guard. So you take those and you take those stereotypes about those particular things and you make it work. And some don't, but yeah. Uh, Brian wants to be a smart ass. He says, absolutely no questions because we already know if Vince doesn't see a gimmick as the main event of WrestleMania, he wouldn't want to waste TV time on it. So obviously the only reason Bastion Booger never got his mania moment is because he didn't embrace the gimmick enough. I mean, right. Well, Brian is an asshole and, and being a smart ass. Um, I'm sorry, Bam Bam Bigelow main event of WrestleMania 11 with Lawrence Taylor. And I don't think you're going to find anybody else with a gimmick. Uh, like Bam Bam Bigelow, but whatever. Next, uh, Sean says, which failed gimmick, in your opinion, did you believe at the time would have had the best long term success? And which early 90s gimmick, sort of pre attitude era, do you th- remember having the best merch sales? Hmm, besides The Undertaker. Well, then you take it, you just took it away from me. I had a bomb, maybe. To talk Adam Bob did well with the glasses. Yeah, I thought the glasses he did. were over. He did in the in the footballs. Those did do well. Thank you for answering the question for me. You're welcome. Last one here from Jeff. We were there any long term plans for Brutus as the Mariner? What the hell was the Mariner? Well, that's what we want to know. I don't I I I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, I love that. Was there a Mar- was there somebody he, he was a Mariner? Yeah, for a minute. Like a week, like a day. Actually, I don't think they actually called him the Mariner ever. Okay. I think I think it was one time where he ran out and did something and crazy shit. Yes. But they never had a name, was never. They ever. don't think they put that in the magazine or something like that? Um, maybe they did, but I know that we never had a name for him at all. On, on TV, you never did it. Or, or, or internally. I, I see, I see. Can you dig it, dig it sucker? Dig it, sucker? Hey, all you wrestling fans out there, it's two time Hall of Famer Booker T. And guess what? The Hall of Fame podcast is now laying it down on Podcast E. Yeah, Book, make sure everybody checks out this week our interview with the Hall of Famer, one of the greatest of all time, Trish Stratus, and five minutes of fame with former NXT Women's Champion Roxanne Perez. So tune in every Friday to the Hall of Fame podcast with Booker T and Brad Gilmore right here on Podcast Heat. Now, can you take that sucker? So, well, Bruce, I, uh, I've been looking forward to this for the entire show. Uh, well, hang on. Cause I, I think I know where you're going, but, but you, you know, I don't talk about current stuff. Well, okay. Okay. But I do, I do want to talk about something current you know kind of in the news and everything and you know you're oh there's been a lot of controversy this week is that yeah. what we're talking about yeah. all the a lot controversy, of controversy and, and, and and controversy over competition and and things people do and or don't do and and look at things and and okay. and, and you know something happened the, the, this week that uh, good lord man the twitterverse blew up created a lot and, of back and forth uh, tons and yes. I, I do want to address it because it, it's look man I'm, I'm personally involved and it affects you know dear friend of mine and everything but um the Houston Astros they were in the playoffs and for their first game in Houston they asked Jim McInvale better known as Mattress Mac from Gallery Furniture 
which has galleryfurniture.com. And if you need a mattress, I would go to Mattress Mac and get the absolute best deal on a mattress and the best sleep you will ever get in your entire life. Um, was set to throw out the first pitch of that game. But the day of, the Astros had personally asked Jim to come out and throw out the first pitch. And the day of the game, the Astros had to call Mac and say, hey, Mac, you can't throw out the first pitch. And he's like, well, I threw out the first pitch of the game where the Astros clinched the World Series last year. Spend millions of dollars advertising the Astros and talking about the Astros and doing a bazillion dollars in the community of Houston, Texas. And this is sorry, but a national sponsor of mattresses that are firm um, called the Major League Baseball and told them they don't want their competitor throwing out the first pitch. So to the Astros, I'll call you out. I'll say, really? A guy that has spent as much money as he has promoting you and doing goodwill for you. And that's how you treat him. And you, you come to, first of all, I hate baseball anyway. So fuck major league baseball. I don't really care for you. Um, it's not real. It's fake. Uh, oh. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I love the Astros from Houston. God bless them. But come on guys. Really? Cause he's in one market. Now, he sells more Tempur-Pedic mattresses than any other dealer in the entire world. But I just thought that was kind of shitty and kind of the shitty things that competition does sometimes. And um, that one kind of pissed me off. That's all. Well, next week, we're going to be talking about the evolution of DX, the original formation of Hunter, Sean, and China. We're going to add in uh, Rick Rude. We'll talk about the rebirth of it with X-Pac and the New Age Outlaws. We're going to break it down. Uh, and in the meantime, if you'd like to advertise on the program, be sure to check us out at advertisewithbruce.com. Love to have your questions about DX next week. It's at Pritchard Show on Twitter and Instagram. Something to wrestle over on Facebook. The easiest, cheapest, best way to support the show is hit that like button and hit that subscribe button on our YouTube at something to wrestle.com. And of course we've got lots of new swag available now over at something to wrestle shirts.com. But Bruce, I, uh, I just recently discovered not too long ago that, uh, the third member of our little trio here, the man behind the scenes, the, the wizard, if you will, pulling the strings and oh, Ramos? the buttons is as Jim Ross would call him bull Ramos, uh, our friend, uh, Dave Silva. And, um, well, I found that he has a talent that I, I didn't Get know out of here. He has no talent. Well, I know that you feel that way, but I, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to break protocol here and I'm going to put our friend Dave Silva on the spot. And I'm going to ask that instead of us having our two shot that we do right now, that we go full screen with our producer, you and I will remain in the stream so people can hear us. Dave, get your camera ready. Uh, go full screen oh, by God. He's Dave. on camera. Oh my God. Come on, blow it up. All right. So there's Dave Silva. He's, uh, running everything for us behind the scenes here. And Dave has a special talent, Bruce. Can you believe it? No, I can't. Well, I know that my favorite WWE wrestler who, uh, well, my favorite male WWE wrestler is Cody Rhodes. 100%. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it also is the favorite in the Silva household. Mm -hmm. And Dave has now developed a special talent, Bruce. And he, we can't show that on camera though. <laughs> well, he hasn't had the ribs removed yet, but I don't know that it would matter, <laughs> but he can, he can actually perform. I want you to not close your eyes, Bruce. I want you to watch this. But if you're listening to this, I encourage you to go to something to wrestle.com. You're not ready for what we're about to show you. Dave Silva, I need you to pretend it's Monday night raw Oof. and we're in the crossover hour or we're in the main event. And it's about time for Cody Rhodes to hit that curtain. And we know before he hits that curtain or before he rises up through the stage, the music is going to be played. So yeah. without further ado, 
This is our crack producer. And by crack, I mean, he might be on crack. Dave Silva's interpretation of Cody Rhodes theme song. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Here we go. My favorite. There can only be 12 wrestling families. Give it all away, give it all away. And I know me now. 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 Then he takes off the belt and he kisses it and he gives it to a kid. And it's beautiful. I love it. Wait, you missed the best part. What part? There's the part where the crowd gets involved. Oh yeah, when they win, when he gets up on the top and he says, and then and then he gets up on the top uh, turnbuckle and he goes, "Whoa!" Like that. Uh, uh, Silva, so, did, did uh, there's a serious you know question. Here. Now, hang on, hang on, first, hang on. Let me go first. Well, serious question here, uh, Silva. So, do you think that the first words to that song are "There are only twelve families in wrestling"? I, I yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of families. That so the he says there's more than one royal family in wrestling. He doesn't say there's twelve families in wrestling. He says it in English. That's maybe what confuses him. <laughs> That's news to me, man. There's there's only one. So okay, uh, let's take That's a look. Nice, at Bruce. Let's take a look at Bruce here, Bruce. Um, yeah, I think you and I are on the same page here, Bruce. Dude. <laughs> aside from aside from the fact that you didn't even know the first line you didn't sing a single word in the song oh, oh I mean, okay I, I, I even know all right listen you get on this program about every other week and do some zz top or some aerosmith oh well, Let's do it. Your turn. You're up, Daddy. Let's do you, Cody. Oh, Ray. I, can do, I, can, I can do it. I, Let's here, do okay, it. Here's the part. See, this is the thing. I, I mean, you you left out the whole most important part where we're just about start the show. Those are the only words I know. Whoa! <laughs> so I did more in that than you did in the whole thing. Did you just say we're about to start the show? Those are the only words I know. Something like that. But I'll tell you this: you did a much better part or job hitting the high spot, the high spot, right? Yeah. Whoa! Was, Whoa! No, you suck. That's terrible. That, that. Yeah. And besides, no. here's the other thing that just that irritates the shit out of me. Oh. Is is that when you know he did it before, which is when we learned of this talent. Yes. He actually, you know, you didn't have to tell him to kiss the belt. He just belt. did it. You know, he just did it. But then you, you give him an opportunity. Yes. To go viral. Yes. You give him an opportunity to shine. He's the next Dave Wills. And he shits the bed. Yes. But I had to Very kiss the belt. Very disappointed in you. I had to kiss the belt and give it to the kids. Yes, but you 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 just did it. Before. All right, you know what? let I'm going to give you another chance to redeem yourself because <laughs> Lord knows on Tuesday night, that entire performance center was hopping when they got to see John Cena and it became almost like a karaoke bar. So let's go full screen on Silva. Silva, get your shit together. You can totally redeem yourself here. Let's hear that John Cena theme as only Dave Silva can do it. Okay, here we go. Scooby Doo! Scooby Doo! Time 
is up. Time is now. This is me and my time is now. The sin is sin, the pound is sin. Then was a then, the my hand, the my die. Then the John Cena's here. He's wearing a cap and a t shirt gear. Now I'm gonna hang a hot a hut. Da 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 da. Scooby Doo, a bad apple. Scooby Doo, a bad apple. Scooby Doo, a bad apple. That's John Cena, man. Bruce, I um. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but I think, um, we want suggestions right now for what song Silva should end next week's show with. <laughs> we are talking about DX. So maybe that's a suitable answer, but do you have requests? We're going to do Silva karaoke and I want you to use hashtag Silva sings, uh, over at Pritchard show on Twitter and Instagram. Bruce, did you expect that this is how we would be winding up today's program? I was not prepared. Wow. That's what he does. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm confused. Do, do we still pay him? Barely. No, the fact that we pay him is too much, but anyway. Well, we, uh, I don't know what I expected, but I got my money's worth right there. And I greatly appreciate, uh, the time today, Bruce. It's always fun when we can get together and talk about some good and maybe even better when we can talk about some bad wrestling next week though one of our better topics the evolution of dx coming up next week right here on something to wrestle with bruce pritchard rock on Whoa! hey hey it's conrad thompson here to tell you a little more about what adfreeshows.com is all about get early ad free access to more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts every single week starting at just nine bucks that's less than 20 cents an episode each month and yes you can listen to them all directly through apple podcasts or your regular podcast apps how easy is that ad free shows also has thousands of hours worth of bonus content and docuseries like title chase eric fires back conversations with conrad and the insiders Plus new series like The Book with David Crockett, Monday Mailbags with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick, and a whole lot more. And you want to talk about early. You can't get any earlier than listening to the shows live. You can be a part of the live studio audience as we record the podcast. Plus ride shotgun alongside your favorite childhood heroes for live watch-alongs, Q&As, and other interactive experiences every single month. Come on now, see for yourself what thousands of other wrestling fans from around the world have discovered that adfreeshows.com is the best value in wrestling. Check it out today. And hey, when you do, the first week is completely free. Adfreeshows.com. <laughs>